everybody. Uh, time for the next story about mirrors and many other things, uh, including art and futures. Uh, today's story is slightly different from uh, the previous one I, I was talking. I perhaps we'll start with a quick review of the feedback I got from from the listeners, from the viewers of, the, of this channel. Um, if in the past I was asked to talk about slow and maybe a to make the story shorter. This time with a very interesting request. I was asked if I could provide a full list of the uh, planned stories, like what, what to expect next. And then even more specifically, if I could provide kind of a matrix which is uh, which would show the, uh, where the stories could be placed, for example chronologically or geographically or any other metrics that would position certain clusters of the stories about the mirrors. That's a, that's a very tough question. Uh, in principle I would love to have this matrix myself. Uh, actually from the very beginning of, of this exploration of the mirrors I was thinking to uh, create such matrix. Um, well, what you, what you see is basically a very, very simplified version, it's not a real one. But uh, I was planning to have this matrix of the categories, which, which would help me to understand the, the placement of mirrors, or the, the meaning of mirrors in a, in a human history. I would basically love to have this matrix myself, and uh, I never succeeded to, uh, despite multiple tries. But I think more importantly, yeah, it's not about this matrix, its availability or not availability. The stories I'm talking about is they're not necessarily uh, to fulfill certain metrics. I would actually, I cherish very much their sort of spontaneous character. I preserve this right to comment on something unexpected, like, you know, it could be a new book or a new exhibition, and then that it triggers me to think differently about the mirror. So um, almost like discarding this matrix or um, destroying the matrix as soon as it is created. Uh, um, for example, this story is um, actually, I, w I was planning to talk about a slightly different story. I was planning to talk about prudence again. I'm still fixated on this topic and I will I'll tell the stories about prudence at least a few more times in the future. This story is a bit of unexpected for me myself. It, it is in some way a response to the current um, sort of epidemic. Not in a way that is I'm where we'll be talking about mirrors and um, how they help people to combat or to fight with epidemics in the past. That, for me, would be too cheap, and I try to avoid those sort of direct reaction of the on, on our contemporary events and so on. But inevitably, this whole situation triggered or created certain filters, and I looked through them on different stories, and I picked up one uh, which I'd like to share with you. Um, another difference of the story from um, some previous ones, uh, it it is because it's actually based on the fairy tale. Uh, we know that there are some famous fairy tales that are centered around mirrors, like Mirror, Mirror on a Wall is just a classical example of that, or Alice Through the Looking Glass. And at some point I would love to talk about these stories too and share my ideas about the, the mirrors. Uh, in the past I was, I was exploring and investigating a few more sort of fairy tales and legendary stories such as Narcissus, for example, or Rinaldi and Armida, and one day I will also tell about those. And today's story is a bit of unusual. It's not necessarily classically mirror story, although mirror, technically speaking, does play a role in it. And um, to start the story, if I show you this picture, very likely you will understand what the story will be about, and actually the majority of people who live today would also do that. It's very, very famous, and it's recognizable, and it's become kind of part of a human cultural heritage. The story of the in English version is known as The Emperor's New Clothes. My story today will be about this fairy tale, and I will tell it in uh, three parts. Sort of one is the current part, the present part, although it will be extended present, and then another part about the past, the story, and then a little bit about the future and specifically about the future role of mirrors, potential roles of mirrors in this story. The present part of the story started quite long ago, in 1837, when it actually first published in Copenhagen. The story was, of course, written by Hans Christian Andersen, the famous Danish writer, uh, perhaps the most famous Danish writer ever. Uh, the majority of people wouldn't even know any other, the second one. Today Andersen is obviously a, a legendary figure in Denmark. 
and many details about his biography are sort of glorified and a bit of a polished and so it's not that easy to get the real picture there are lots of sort of fake news around it he was born in 1805 so very beginning of 19th century uh, in relatively remote uh, city for uh, for Denmark he in a very poor family uh, his father was a uh, woodcarver uh, I read uh, also a bit of a strange figure very uh, eccentric uh, he didn't get any good education um, in in his youth uh, when um, soon after his father died when he was 11 he decided to go alone uh, to Copenhagen and then it was perhaps a very very bumpy start uh, he was singing in a, in a chorus uh, where he was eventually expelled when uh, his voice lost his sort of juvenile beauty he was working temporarily in the theater with sort of limited success and then uh, he started writing at this moment although um, he got his education eventually in Copenhagen but not very uh, good one and I think um, quite late I think just to give you an idea he finished the sort of secondary school when he was already was 23 uh, he was writing with mistakes till the end of his life contemporary sources would say it's kind of he was dyslexic um, but you never know these days and I think also uh, from the very youth he was very tall very sort of lean thin and also not necessarily very attractive I guess he was bullied a lot and on top of that he had lots of issues he was he had a lot of phobias and um, today we would call very neurotic character um, a lot of fears concerns paranoia almost uh, issues so I think well it, again it's very difficult to say it now apparently he was not necessarily very uh, easygoing kind of twisted personality at least so he eventually Anderson began to write uh, he thought to make a career of the writer or maybe at the journalist he published a few essays uh, some sort of novel or a short novel and eventually in uh, 35 he published three first uh, fairy tales uh, they got some traction and success and uh, he continued to do that to publish new and then by uh, 1837 he published this uh, first kind of book of the fairy tales with nine stories including the Emperor Nicholas so actually Emperor is one of the earliest stories of Anderson uh, it is in fact very very short so sometimes the story is so short, so short it's easy to to read it, read it aloud and then instead of just tell the, the essence. So to I will try to represent it very quickly uh, through a series of illustrations. It's a very contemporary illustration by the Omar Ayam. The fairy tale starts from the description of the imaginary kingdom and the emperor uh, that he is so fascinated with himself, basically narcissistic personality, and then also very. Um, fixated on his uh, dresses he basically spent more time on the wardrobe than in uh, whatever city council um, then uh, we see the two swindlers uh, appearing in the city and they explicitly describe the swindlers who present uh, the capacity to make very innovative beautiful and refined fabric and then eventually uh, make a cost costume a dress for the for the Emperor and in, in addition to that it's refinement and, and beauty the fabric has a very unique quality it uh, it is it could be seen only by people who are smart basically it cannot be seen by silly people stupid people but also by people who are not on their place how to describe in the story the king is obviously um, intrigued and he commissioned uh, the tailors to make the story he's also supplied them with whatever the materials and the words so but from the very beginning we explicitly told that it, they do nothing they basically their looms remains to be empty uh, they only pretend to make something and uh, in reality they do nothing so eventually the, the Emperor sends his ministers to sort of see the progress uh, nothing happens obviously and when arriving in the Taylor's studio these ministers uh, I think the two are sent uh, one after another they don't see anything but they're too afraid to admit this uh, so they basically go back to the king and say that the fabric is indeed beautiful the next scene is when the king himself comes to to check and then he also cannot admit he doesn't see anything and then he approves the the dress uh, and this is actually the only scene when we the mirror plays a role it, the, the what called the long or the tall mirror is mentioned in the scene 
when the king uh, looked at himself. And then the climax is, of course, this demonstration in the city or the procession when the king, in his new dress, so-called dress, walks through the city and everybody admires him, the court and, of course, the public, until the moment when, of course, uh, some young boy shout that the emperor has nothing. In Danish, this fra the sentence is, the emperor has nothing, uh, was translated, the, the, the emperor is, is a naked. Into some languages, Russian, for example, but I think also Spanish and Portuguese, they, in their version, the, the emperor is naked. So that's basically it. The story is actually very sort of black and white and unambiguous. We always know the who is who and what's the characters and so on. So it's really a moralistic tale. What is interesting to note, to note is that it's actually not resolved in a classical sort of moralistic tale, that the evilness is not punished. Basically, even after the boy shouts uh, his words, nothing particularly changed. The procession goes, uh, the king still admires himself, and the court still accepts this, and the swindlers, uh, the tailors, and the, the living unpunished, uh, nobody caught them, and nothing has happened. In principle, they shouldn't even leave because everybody is around them would accept this even new dress they would make if if to follow the logic of the story so that's actually a pretty strange ending uh often left sort of not very much noticed speaking about anderson again after the story uh just to kind of maybe wrapping up the anderson story he became increasingly famous because of the stories in uh more, much more because of the stories than any other of his creations. He lived a long life. Um, by the end of his life, he wrote something 150 stories. Not all of them famous, but some are. They're really sort of part of the cultural capital of humanity. So great. Um, this particular story, of course, it belongs to one of the most famous. It has its own traction. It was translated to variety of languages. I think I read somewhere the more than 100 languages it's translated to. It's incredibly famous and it's kind of iconic character. So uh, at some point, because of popularity, uh, it became illustrated. We see here two illustrations uh, created by a Danish um, painter of this time, quite famous in this time, William Pedersen, famous landscape painter. And then this, this particular tale got two illustrations, one of those two swindlers, and one this famous procession. Um, worth noting that King is actually not naked. In, in, in any sense, he couldn't be naked because uh, his costumes would be put on top of the underskirts and other gowns and so on. So he, well, this would be still insulting, but at his time and therefore it's enough to sort of for the boy to shout. Uh, but he's not naked in a, in a classical sense. And this tradition of depicting naked, uh, so not naked King, uh, remains the. Uh, I will I will show a few more illustrations. This is like end of nineteenth century, beginning of twentieth century. Um, you see, it's basically following the same pattern. The king is presented, kind of humiliatingly under underdressed, but not at least not that big. Maybe with time, uh, this tradition changed, and King is increasingly depicted as being naked or semi-naked. You see here, for example, the, the pictures from the 30th of 20th century. Uh, the, the, but this time, not only the tale was translated, but also the different play, the cartoons and theatric plays were play, um, performed, and eventually uh, movies and so on. There's, there's a whole number of them in different cultures and different um, languages. Um, and then increasingly, as you see, I show you a few pictures, increasingly the king is portrayed as naked uh, uh, in different stages, for example, when he's uh, trying his dress and also, of course, when he's performing, when he's doing this procession. Uh, another interesting quality that the king is increasingly presented sort of more ugly, more fat, uh, sort of bold and not necessarily pleasant. So that's a sort of a, a novel twist. And then um, if we reflect a little bit on that, that actually make the, the whole fairy tale is very, uh, very weak in, in a way, especially in our contemporary culture. And I actually expect some kind of hit back by the very fact that somebody's presented himself naked, like in our contemporary world would say, so what? Uh, that's not a big deal. Um, um, for example, this famous movie by now, already 25 years ago, Pret de Porte, uh, there was a famous scene of the, the Scott walk when the models are naked. And it's actually after first sort of small shock, then everybody accepted that it's uh, 
of course, actually ultimate human beauty of the human body. So nothing shameful about this. Also, if if you play with a sort of a deformed body of the king in a contemporary culture, which is a sort of um, criticizes body shaming. Um, the, so what's so special? In fact, I expect some heat back, and saying it is it is okay for king to be that. Even the, the sort of central point of king, king being sort of more feminine figure, uh, would actually we would expect, for example, uh, the queen being kind of playing with her dresses. But um, this will be kind of typical, stereotypical uh, portraying of femininity and female and male figures. Um, the king here plays kind of almost queer role. Uh, but um, in our culture, to be queer is actually a new norm. It's not to be queer, which is abnormal. So again, the, the depiction of the king as sort of obsessed with the fashion and dresses, again, shouldn't itself be a point of criticism. And maybe just to conclude this, the mirrors didn't play uh, particular roles in, in the scene. They didn't help to discover this sort of fakeness. Even this is very interesting, for example, uh, uh, picture from one of the illustrations when the king does not believe in what he sees or what he doesn't see, and he's basically trying to check it with other senses, for example, touching it in a mirror, not in his in his own uh, on his own body. So you could imagine the mirror could play a bigger role in kind of dis deciphering, sort of dropping this illusion or destroying this illusion that the swindlers created, but it didn't. So in 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 the in the story itself, the mirror didn't play much role. Uh, but this uh, interpretation, this line of interpretation, is sort of narcissistic king who is self-obsessed uh, and just playing with the dresses, is not the major line of interpretation. Of course, much stronger one um, touch on a different um, line of uh, train of thoughts. Um, from my perspective, I'm familiar with that because of sort of like in the in the Soviet Union and the sort of Russian speaking tradition, which is actually by the way the the, the tale is known as um, the, the, for example the boy is shouting the king is naked, so it's often called naked king rather than uh, just simply new clothes of the emperor. Um, back in the thirties, in nineteen thirties, um, Russian writer Evgeny Schwartz, uh, he created a series of fairy tales. Uh, they were called. Each of them was actually a compilation of the few uh, stories by Anderson. I think the very first was was a compilation of this uh, Emperor Nicholas, but I think also the one was about the princess and the pea, and then um, uh, one more, uh, and then. Well, it was not so much retelling, but kind of reinterpreting them and positioning them in a, in a sort of more contemporary uh, environment. Worth noting that, for example, uh, this story was never published in the 30s because it was obviously uh, perceived and perhaps was quite explicit critique of the regime of Stalin at this time. And then it was published only in the 60s uh, after Stalin died and actually after the, the Schwarz himself died. Uh, and then eventually it was performed by, um, it was staged in, on a theater, quite a famous theater, but also a bit of a dissident, and became quite a famous, because it, it obviously it, it was still uh, seen as a, as a critical, uh, but this time not about Stalin, but about the current uh, Soviet regime in, in, a, in the 70s, uh, or in the 60s, for example. Uh, in, in his version, uh, obviously, the king is not just kind of... Uh, Narcissist, fesh, you know, fixated on the fashion. He's actually a very evil tyrant, and then he's imposing his opinion on on his court uh, and any anybody else who's living in this kingdom. So basically, any attempt to object, uh, sort of express disbelief, created quite a severe punishment. Um, not symbolic, but quite actual, which is very much resembling what was happening, for example, in, in the thirties in the Soviet Union. But it's also not not so exceptional. Nothing. There's nothing specifically exceptional, exceptionally Soviet or Russian about this. The same story was told about Hitler in in uh, in Germany or Frank in Spain or anywhere else. Uh, that's the kind of magic of the stories because it's becoming universally applicable and it kind of shows fundamentally this sort of interlocked uh, situation of the power abuse. There's a sort of the, the, the power holder with the king or emperor or, or your own boss, for example, in your company, right? Or your current um, whoever, president, city mayor, anybody who's holding authority. 
and has a power to impose it and punish for those people who disagree. And then eventually this creates sort of very vicious loop or circle of sort of interdependence. The power that produces a story and then a, you know, at least a huge number of people cannot object or then therefore don't want to object and they're becoming kind of supporting the story. That's fundamentally what this, this tale is about. Not surprisingly, it's popular universal even today. There's, for example, the, today's it's a, kind of a whole series of uh, caricatures or cartoons on Trump as a classical uh, figure of the stories. We see lots of them. But, um, however, some people can find them appealing, some people find them insulting, uh, for example, Trump supporters. The very same uh, edition, the very same newspaper who published it today about Trump, published something similar about um, Obama a few years ago. So Obama was new emperor. So, and then you could find them right now about anybody. You could find them about Putin, you could find them about any other boss. It's very, very sort of familiar trope. Um, as soon as you have a power, you have a right to kind of accuse this power in this um, sort of a, the, the nakedness or emptiness, which, which is, as we, if you remember the story, basically uh, resultless. It doesn't bring anything because the same as with the boy shouting that the, the emperor is naked, the critique of this position doesn't change anything. And that's also kind of a tragical existential twist of the story. Uh, the story actually could be written on by Anderson by Søren Kierkegaard, the, the famous Danish uh, existentialist. Before I will jump to the contemporary and sort of futuristic interpretation of the story, um, I would actually like to go back to the, to the roots of the story. Uh, Anderson created some stories on his own, it's basically his creations. Some of them he took from um, sort of more folkloristic um, roots and uh, sources, and some others he borrowed from various other literature sources. And then Emperor Nate King, the Emperor New Clothes, uh, basically belongs to the third category. And it, he, Anderson himself quite explicitly admitted that he found the sources of the story in a very known book um, um, called Tales of the Count uh, Lucanor. And this is quite an interesting um, book itself. It was written, in fact, very long ago in the 14th century in Spain. Well, back then it wasn't Spain, it was uh, the Kingdom of Aragon and Sevilla. But um, the, the person who wrote the story, uh, Don Juan Manuel, uh, he belonged to the really uh, a royal family. He was one of the descendants of the, um, the the emperor, the king of the of this time, Ferdinand the uh, Third. He was a nephew of the another very famous emperor. In fact, his his uh, family castle still exists. It's in a small town in Vilenia. Uh, he wrote quite a few uh, different books. Some of them survived, some didn't. But this sort of tales of the Count Lucanor, perhaps the most famous, and it's, it's pretty large. It consists of five books, a, consisting of the stories and sort of uh, fables and sort of morals, quotations, and so on. Quite a big volume. It's still quite popular in Spanish literature. It's published, it's published for adults, like a series historical documents. It's also published for kids as a sort of collection of the um, interesting stories. The story of Anderson was based on one of the stories of the Count Lucanor, whose official name is Count Lucanor and, and his uh, assistant Patronio. So basically the two people uh, traveling and doing something but then sharing the stories. Um, um, this particular story, it starts as typical for many of the stories from this book, as, as a dialogue between the Count and uh, his, his assistant. When the Count described his situation, that he sort of was approached by some other lord, was an interesting proposition, but it, this lord asked him to keep it in secret, that he shouldn't uh, share it with anybody. He has to basically make his own decision, and it's very delicate, and so on. So basically, and then at this moment Count said, um, I'd like to share this with you, Patronio. And Patronio, in response to this request, explained him, like, visibly hesitated to accept this, and uh, as a way to not refusing, but basically say, I, in this situation I will tell you the story. And then he described the story about the king and uh, in this particular case it's the three tailors who did approach the city. But the plot within the story is pretty similar with a couple of interesting um, differences. The, the magical quality of this fabric uh, 
is in fact not just to show or it's not the silly people who wouldn't see that but people who are illegitimately born basically if you are illegitimate son or offspring uh, of your parents then you wouldn't see the story that's a strikingly different uh, quality uh, well interesting to know that the, the stories of this uh, Don, Don Manuel they themselves have some roots and some of them track even back to the sort of old Indian story so both for Spanish society, kind of aristocratic, very sort of um, related to the position, and in, basically it's a blood uh, link, it's a kingship related society, when the blood links are, are this is what matters. The same is in, in India, it's basically a coastal society, uh, so you, you, your position in society depends on the family you, you are from, and if you are a legitimate son, basically all your position, all your uh, status uh, can disappear one in one go in one second so that's pretty heavy it's much more you know important and threatening than just to say i'm silly or not so silly so it's really life-threatening a uh, condition then of course the story goes as it goes the king uh and his ministers are equally terrified they don't admit that basically swindlers got the awards so the rest of the story goes very uh similar in a similar way but the morale sort of the the conclusion of that when patronio explained the story uh, they discussed that that's actually the, the mistake of the king, that he relied on the opinion of people who depended on him. Therefore, they couldn't be objective. Therefore, he failed because of his uh, appellation, uh, sort of his request to the people who were not objective, couldn't be objective. And then after the story, basically, count, the count admits and um, sort of, you know, withdraw his request to Petronio to participate in his deal. So that's a kind of framing, uh, change the story entirely. So it's not about the um, king being sort of narcissistic, or uh, even it's not about even um, the, um, his minister or his court being dependent on his sort of wish. It's basically quite a complex cognitive trick that you shouldn't rely on opinion of people who are dependent on you. That's almost like <laughs> epistemological uh, formula. And it's quite well captured in the story of uh, Don Manuel, and it's entirely missing in the story of Anderson. He this, he did basically excluded this sort of framing, and of course, um, partly because of that, uh, the story got a very different spin. It is not to say that the spin is not important. For example, this whole kind of uh, power abuse is obviously important uh, element of the story, but I feel uh, uh, that it's. Um, kind of missed opportunity to address a much more serious issue. So that's basically kind of beginning of my future part of the story. Uh, it's reflecting on the, uh, not the story, but it's possible sort of alternative versions of alternative sort of unfoldings. In the current situation, if you see on this formula of the story, when we see three major characters, the king or the emperor itself, the, the tailors, swindlers, and his court, all basic class, and the sort of external, the boy, or in some cases, actually, the girl who is shouting. Um, when we see that, we see it from above, right? So we kind of presented the story. As soon as we are putting ourselves in the story, we would love to associate ourselves with this boy slash girl. Uh, who's critiquing the king and sort of shouting and laughing about the uh, the court and how stupid they are. As soon as we kind of exclude the boy, <laughs> because actually it's a magical figure, it's almost like the most magical figure in the story is this boy. You shouldn't believe it's even existed uh, in principle. What if you put yourself in these three characters? Who are you then? Are you uh, the, the course? And the Schwarz explained very much, uh, very well that as soon as you're dependent on the forces, you could imagine a situation where you don't change your voice, you don't change your opinion, because of you terrified uh, of the power and the punishment. Or, and or, you basically be believing fully into the story uh, that they imposed by you uh, on this power that be sort of politically correctly accepting the status quo. Or, uh, how many of you would associate yourself with, <laughs> with those swindlers? Maybe you have to exploit very efficiently sort of existing uh, frameworks or you even create maybe new myths new mythologies and how many of you associate yourself with it with an emperor with this king what if you're a king what, how would you advise what you should advise yourself to keep this sort of a plot going what would you suggest to yourself being the king 
how would you could break this illusion of the sort of self uh, deception and that's not easy in fact uh, and that's actually the question for the for the mirrors um, can any mirror be of, of, of any help and then the question is what kind of mirror should be designed to help the poor king or the poor emperor to sort of with, with his uh, fight against his self illusioning and that's uh, maybe again the difference between this story and other ones. It's not that I necessarily know the answer, I keep thinking, so that's back to my the very beginning of the story, that I don't necessarily have this matrix to kind of lay down all the possible things. I'm using this exercise of whole mirror stories to provoke myself, to challenge myself, and that's a very good example of that. Not necessarily that I, I know the answer and what kind of mirror, but I keep thinking about this, what could be done? what could be uh, invented to help the, the king itself and um well maybe the kind of conclusion uh it's the picture is from the the, the native city of andersen in denmark Odense. um it is obviously presenting almost exactly this three figures so we see the king by the way naked and deformed kind of the typical fat uh king which is again laughing about the king was haha in the past right now i think this sculpture or this monument could be heavily critiqued by the the anti-body shamers uh, then we see apparently swindlers and the third figure we can say um, it's uh, ministers just basically again these three figures and who you exactly you associated as soon as you're standing outside as observer yeah you're free to laugh about the story you could critique any sort of emperor actually pointlessly and resultlessly but as soon as you put yourself in this picture, that's a very different story. Again, it's exactly as I said. Um, who are you and how to help it? As a sort of possible solution, I could convert this picture in the mirror. <laughs> that would be interesting mirror. The mirror would show you not only yourself, but the whole interplay that basically shows all these three um, figures or maybe many more positions and role plays and then you cannot just be alone looking at yourself you have to consider other dimension and maybe you could have it you would have a chance to see this sort of interlocked vicious circle of relying on people who are dependent on you for example um, otherwise um, the story is becoming kind of nice um, story for kids without toothless like toothless story for, for kids I have this funny example I uh, showed you, this, uh, the, the postcard I got once, it's actually from Japan. Um, well, the, the story is uh, typically uh, one of the many illustrations of the Emperor, um, the enclosed of Emperor's New Clothes story, but it was sent to me uh, on occasion of New Emperor of, of Japan. The, for the person, it was just lovely, sentimental story. That's a, that's a story about emperor, and we have now a new emperor in uh, in Japan. So that's kind of it's for people. It's the story in this sort of uh, superficial, toothless way, becoming almost praising again. Fantastic! We have it's a story about nice emperor, <laughs> like lovely emperor. The fact that this story is actually about severely critiquing sort of the regime of producing knowledge and verifying knowledge that's actually what we have now i believe in this in this crisis it's for us or at least for me and for our team this crisis is not about healthcare or medical issues it's about this massive dysfunctional dysfunctionality and sort of huge uh, clashes of the the validity of the knowledge what we consider right knowledge what we consider wrong knowledge and who are we and who are the sort authorities so it's a very much um, conflict of this cognitive apparatus of contemporary society and interestingly enough this um the story about the snake king uh could give us interesting clue and maybe you can help to think about um uh, new devices we can design or invent or at least think about uh, to that would help us to kind of uh, uh, reflect and then break through this um, situation um, as always all your comments are very very welcomed um, that's it for for now <laughs> some more food for food for you um, until next stories and then uh, next story will be about prudence see you